So, Jason, welcome. Mark Beckett, welcome. Um, we've got our grid meetup tonight, which is all about apartment buildings and scaling your portfolio. And I'm excited because we've got a good friend of ours, Jason Stubblefield, on here, who's going to share his wisdom. We uh, we took we took we we hijacked your notes, Jason, and we gridified it. Is that cool with you? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Did you get a chance to, to look over the slides? All right. I did. I gave him a quick, quick Okay, meeting. good. Anyway, we're, we're just going to – it's it's just a way for us to, to keep track and stay on schedule. But more than anything, guys, what I want to encourage everybody that's on here right now is that this is really – we help facilitate a conversation, and this is a collaboration. This is a discussion, right? We're going to go back and forth and how to invest in apartment buildings and, um, and how to scale your portfolio. And we, we just help facilitate this mastermind, right? We're blessed that we've got uh, great members and leaders in this group um, to help share their wisdom with us. And you know, I'm gonna share what I know, Mark will share what he knows and we'll have Jason here. And anybody else that wants to jump in, feel free to jump in and, and share. You can literally unmute, We'll let you unmute. We'll let you turn your video on. You can chat with us. And by the way, if you have a question, you could always just use the chat feature in here and uh, and ask a question, right? And we're and we'll we'll get to those questions. Um, I'll help monitor those questions, right? So that's right. So let's start at the beginning. Who are we? Who are you, Mark Beckett? What are we doing here? What is this? Doing. Uh, so you're Rob. I'm Rob. I'm Mark. Together we are the Casa Group, except there's like another 30 people besides us. Uh, but I run Casa Construction, which is one of our sister companies that focuses on uh, construction activity, like pre-sale renovations for our listing clients, a little bit of kitchen and bath kind of work. Uh, hopefully we uh, do our own renovations uh, here with our guys every so often. So we try to get a couple of deals in every year. We've got a couple we're looking at now occasional wholesale. So if you're ever looking for deals, stay in touch. Uh, we do occasionally sell our deals uh, when we're particularly busy. Um, and right now we're busy. The market is really busy. It's really good. Rob, maybe you can talk about that. But uh, we've got work everywhere. Everybody's selling, everybody's fixing, everybody's renovating. Uh, there is a, a ton going on, so we're busy. Uh, but obviously, always, uh, always interested in looking for more. So anybody needs construction services, let me know. Anybody looking for a deal, uh, let me know. Uh, we'd love to be a part of that. So that's what I'm doing. Cool. Rob, what do you and doing? Yeah, no, I know. Mark, you're right. The, um, and by the way, your audio is a little low, so you might want to, I don't know if it's just me, but. I'll just scream. We'll, okay. So um, I'm Rob Chavez. I help facilitate this Reston group that we have called Grid in Reston. And, um, you know, we, we, uh, we've surpassed our production numbers uh, on the agent, on the brokerage side. Um, from this time last year. So obviously the market is active. We, you know, we're blessed that it is active. We, we have so many friends that are other business owners that um, are experiencing tremendous hardship during this time. So, um, you know, we're here to support them. Um, on the agent side, it's active for a couple of reasons, right? Low inventory and low interest rates. I mean, I just bought a property last month as an investment um, and uh, the interest rate was... 3.2% as, you know, as an investor low, as a, an investor deal, which is really low. Like it was crazy low. And I just heard somebody the other day locked in at a 3% investment deal. So um, interest rates are driving demand right now. And, uh, and so, you know, while, while this is still, so by the way, if you haven't refinanced, if you do so. Uh, if you, if you thought about buying, do so, right. Um, you know, with, with the caveat of you, you should be buying long-term, right? Thinking about, about long-term, but what a great time to refinance as an investor right now. So, you know, sometimes I was talking to my business partner about this yesterday. It's painful because we have so many properties that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not easy to, to refinance when you got a lot of properties, but it's so worth it. Like when you do it. So, yep. Oh, somebody just said, just refinanced, you know, uh, a rental at 2.875%. Wow. Crazy. That is crazy. That's awesome, Kathleen. Very cool. 
So, um, so by the way, do me a favor. If you're on here, if you're brave enough to like, you know, like Andy, jump on, show your video. Awesome. It, it creates energy. We want to create as much energy as we typically have, like in, in a room when we're live together. Uh, and, and if, and if you want to stay anonymous, that's cool too. But at a minimum, put in your questions into the chat. And more importantly, if you, if you just want to say, Hey, I'm an investor in, you know, uh, buying holes here in Reston, put that in the chat. Or if you're a new investor, say I'm a new, you know, because part of this is building your network. It's being able to collaborate with people virtually, uh, which, you know, isn't quite the same thing. Like when we're live with everybody, we're going to get back to these event, live events beginning of next year, hopefully God willing. Um, but at a minimum, let's try to see if we can collaborate like this online as much as possible, right? So while we're doing that, Rob, can I ask, because Kathleen uh, just shared that real strong rate with Atlantic Coast Mortgage, uh, she says, Kathleen, if you have a contact there that you'd recommend, uh, I think a lot of people might get some value from that. If you want to drop that in the chat also, it would be great. Yeah, it'd be great. Um, yes. Christy Hardy is my point of contact. K-R-I-S-T-I -I and Hardy, H-A-R-D-Y. I can put it in the chat too. That would be awesome. great. That would be Powers great. of the network. Yes. Cool. Okay, Mr. Beckett, next slide. All right. So do we want to do one last introduction here for our special guest speaker? Let's get let's uh let's get him at the end. Let's get him. Right. We're gonna come and, back. We're gonna come back. And right forward. here, everybody just put in what your niche is into the chat, what you might be looking for. If you're looking for investment deals in a particular area, put that into the chat, right? If you um, you know, if you want to be brave enough and you know, go on camera and say, hey, this is what I this is who I am, this is what I'm looking for. Uh, do it right like Kathleen you're on here you're unmuted right yeah uh, you, know, you could tell people a little bit about you know where you invest and what you focus on and and then other investors will be able to connect with you either online or you know afterwards absolutely I'm fairly new we have one rental out in Loudoun County um, that we were going to 1031 but we decided to refinance pull some money out and possibly just use that money at that low interest rate to um, get started in our second rental. And um, we're also invested with a group of investors um, just very passively in an um, apartment complex down in Oklahoma City. Um, so that one is a, a syndicated deal and we just sat back and put some money into that one. Awesome. Very new. Awesome. Well, last month we talked about syndicating deals and using self-directed IRA money. So if anybody has an interest in that, we'll, we'll make sure that we get them access to that video. Very cool. Anybody else wanna jump in or even put into the chat? If not, no problem. Mark, I will monitor a little bit on the other side. Why don't we introduce Jay, Jason, why don't you introduce yourself at this point? Go ahead. And then we'll just jump straight into it. All right. Uh, name, Jason Stubblefield. Uh, I've known Rob, know Mark for a while now. Great guys. I always got a lot of energy, a lot of information. I mean, just as long as I know you all, you've been just constantly pouring out information when it comes to real estate. So I really appreciate y'all for doing that. Uh, with me, I started my multifamily journey back in 2015, really with a decision. Um, and nothing really came to fruition until 2016. Started with a uh, smaller complex, uh, 34 units, uh, then got into something a little larger with syndication into 48 unit and then uh, much lar larger when I started partnering with teams um, in the Dallas area. So uh, scale the portfolio right now we sit a little over 900 units and I'm a general partner in um, and really just try to continue to grow the business and then give out information and help anybody that I can on platforms like this. Jason, when you started, like when you first came to grid, had you, had you already been investing? I had single family experience, I think. Yeah. Okay. What got you into the multifamily? We're going to go through that a little bit, but I'm just curious about that journey for you. Yeah. It's one of the things that I, um, I really want to get the message out. It was just, just like when it comes to scaling, right? I, I wanted, I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, that, that whole formula. I was like, all right, I need to go get rentals and that's going to be my retirement. What got you into the multifamily? 
Um, but then once I actually started, right, actually looking at the numbers and how long it was going to take, I was like, God, this is going to take forever in order to build up enough units. And so that's what led me to look for something else. And really, I was just trying to start with something smaller. But the speed is, is what I was looking for when it came to building a portfolio. And, and let everybody know, you know, by, by, I guess, by trade, you're an engineer, right? Right. Yep. Computer software, computer science, yeah. computer software. Yep. Yep. <laughs> Leave forever, ever. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. yeah I, I felt like it was going to take forever just doing one house at a time. So, yep. Yeah. Hey, and, and Lee Johnson, you, we, we always love your input, man. So you want to jump in here and you contribute like we, you bring the energy. Um, we always appreciate it. So it will take a long time. Okay. Well, let's go through, let's go through pros and cons of buying apartment buildings. Oh yes. Legal stuff. We're not accountants. We're not attorneys. Do your own due diligence, right? Um, you know, we're going to share with you what we do, but always vet everything that you hear online and anybody that you go into business with, vet them, right? Uh, and so with that, pros and cons of buying apartment buildings. So let's go through, Jason. You started talking about the pros already. What are some of the pros, right? Just off the cuff, what are some of the pros? You don't have to read the slides. Just tell me. What are some of the pros that you know? Um, obviously, it's larger, having a consolidation of units, right? So instead of having single families spread out in one geographic location, you have them all in one place. Um, it's also more scalable, right? The bigger you go, the more you can get property managers involved. You usually can also save on cost, right? So if you have... If you're buying, you know, 30 refrigerators, right? You go to Lowe's, you set up a Lowe's account, you can get a discount off of uh, all the appliances that you're buying because you can buy it in bulk, set up an account, they'll store it there for you. Um, having a maintenance person on staff, having a leasing agent on staff, it really backs you out out of having to do some of the day-to-day -day management stuff that you get when you do um, a residential portfolio, right? So even when it comes to, say you've got a property manager, they're not really handling a lot of stuff. A lot of times that property manager would just turn around and call you, say, hey, toilet's broke, and call the owner and tell the owner, hey, toilet's broke. And then, uh, you know, it's just like, what did you call me for? I, I could have took that call myself. Um, but you find those economies of scales and then with growth, um, it's really some of the big benefits when it comes to multifamily. Yeah, and I think... Um, uh, what I love about it, some of the big things, right? It's like number three, you can increase the value of those assets. You know, I always think of an apartment building. It's, it's a little business, right? When you buy even a little house, it's a little business. Mm -hmm. And the goal is to reduce those expenses and increase the income. And you can increase the value of that business. And there's just so much opportunity when you know how to be a good operator, right? Um, owning multifamily is about being a good operator, I would imagine. So, yeah, I mean, that, what you just said is the biggest one. I mean, that's probably the number one distinction between them is the ability to value your property based off the income that it generates, meaning that if you can make it make more money, you can increase the value versus being a residential where you're sort of limited by what the comparable properties are going to sell for. So mm -hmm. even if you, you know, no matter what you rehab, no matter what you do, put in gold toilets, um, doesn't matter if they... If your neighbor sells for 400000 that's going to be you. But um, oftentimes you'll see, especially like with people who are doing Airbnb, right? They may get like a, a two unit, three unit, four unit, something that's still considered residential. And they're Airbnb in and pulling in, you know, crazy amounts of, of money on a monthly basis, which is fine for the owner. But you don't get to actually take advantage of that value because they're just going to compare you to somebody else's two or three units. Got it. Got it. Got it. And, and so let's go through some of the cons real fast of buying apartment buildings. What are some of the challenges people come across? The money, uh, mm -hmm. number one, uh, that's, that's a big hurdle because, you know, usually instead of talking in hundreds of thousands, uh, you're talking in upper hundreds of thousands or sometimes millions or, you know, multi-millions. So um, getting over that is definitely something to overcome. Um, I would also say the, the knowledge barrier is a little bit different. It's, it's not 
as easy depending on how you want to do it so if you're going to do it with with your own money yeah it's it's not that difficult for you right you sort of take in your income expenses just like you would do on a on a residential property but if you're going to do something more advanced like syndication or if you're going to venture with somebody to sort of tackle that money piece right now you got to get into something creative you may have to have a little bit more knowledge you may be talking about splits uh, investor splits distribution stuff like that so got it your first deal you did it by yourself right right you essentially put your own money where your mouth was to, to learn <laughs> but what an education right to yep. learn you know through that which i love um, you know, what people aren't aware of, newer people that might be on here, is that, you know, you can buy multifamily duplexes, triplexes, quads, we're going to cover that here in a little bit. And all of those are all financed under 30 year, you know, Fannie Mae, Freddie, uh, Freddie Mac loans, right? You can get some residential loans on it. But as soon as you go to five plus units, uh, you're now in, in commercial loan territory. And so interest rates are going to be a little bit higher. Um, you're going to be uh, looking at terms that are might be five years to 15 years, which, you know, could sometimes create some market exposure, right? And so people need to be aware of that. They're not aware of that. But the great news is that they're going to be looking at, um, you know, they're going to be looking at the income stream, not just you, but also the income stream that's coming from that asset, right? Uh, what would be your advice for anybody going after units that are five and more, five and greater, right? Multifamily about getting started when it comes to the money piece with banks. Yeah. You want to start with local banks, portfolio lenders is what they call them. So the mom and pop bank that's going to do your loan and probably keep it in house. You won't find a lot of success. You won't find favorable rates oftentimes. Uh, if you're going to some of these bigger banks, your Wells Fargo, um, you know, the Bank of America, those banks aren't going to give you the great terms that you're looking for. But if you're in an area, um, go to a local bank in that same area that probably knows the property, they're comfortable with the area, and then talk to that bank. You'll probably find some of your better financing there. Got it. Got it. Got it. Cool. Um, mm -hmm. Lee Johnson put something in here. Value Investment Partners, uh, are they, do they fund? Is that what they do, Lee? Do I believe that is Lee's company. Yeah, that's, oh. that's Lee. Lee does everything. Awesome. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> You'll help you find the money. I love hey, it. Yeah. <laughs> Just got hey, that. I got the kids in the background, but thanks for the plug, Rob. <laughs> awesome, man. For sure. For sure. Always, always. That, hey, the powers in connecting people. That's what I say. It's like, that's what this is really about. So that the relationships you form and the connections you form. Well, cool, Mark. Let's go to the next slide. Okay. Well, and before we do that, I've got a question maybe for, for you, Jason. Uh, maybe you can dispel a, a con or a myth or a limiting belief maybe that, that I've got, maybe other people have. I would assume or I had assumed that it might be a little more difficult to get into apartment investing because there's so many other like professional investors out there. I feel like I've got at least some ability to try to you know, control my own destiny and find a deal and work my network and work my resources, do my marketing, do whatever it is to find my kind of local residential deal. But if I'm trying to find a 10 unit apartment building or a hundred unit apartment, whatever it is, I feel like I'm going to be competing against all these other like professional full-time guys, but you're finding deals, right? It's not a, not really any easier or harder from a competitive standpoint than just regular residential deals, I'm guessing, right? agree with that? I would to a certain extent. So honestly, like when you say like in that five to 20, 30 unit range, you really don't find a lot of the bigger institutional players or the guys who just do it as a, as a business. Uh, that unit size really caters to the, um, you know, the guy like me, right? The, the software developer, the doctor, somebody who likes real estate, who, who gets multifamily and they compete. And honestly, that's where you'll find a lot of the better deals at nowadays. So that there's pros when it comes to having less competition there. There's cons because 
of some of the financing. So one thing that, that we didn't really hit on when we talked about financing is it is a little bit harder to finance with a commercial bank, but the larger your property is, the easier it gets, or I should say the more expensive the property is, the easier it gets and the better the terms. So you can lock in, you know, a, a 30 year, um, a 30 year amateur amortization with like a 12 year term on a Freddie Mac or a Fannie Mae loan, uh, which is really favorable. And there are even uh, sub 3% interest rates right now. So wow. you, you can get that on, you know, millions of dollars of property, but that property needs to be above a million dollars for you to qualify for that finance. The loan amount needs to be above a uh, million dollars for them to want to, to want to um, do that financing. You can get away with maybe eight, 900 grand, but they want to really see above a million dollar profit on that. Um, so that's one of the things just to note when it comes to financing and how easy or difficult that is. But getting in, it's, it's not that hard. I mean, I'm not that smart of a guy. You know, I don't want anybody listening to this and be like, oh, you know, Jason's got all this, this wisdom and stuff. Really not. It's, it's income, expenses, and cap rates. Um, and once you understand how the pieces of that puzzle fit together, uh, then you just get creative and, and come up with ways to find the money. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about the next couple of slides. We're going to go through cap rates and figuring out cap rates and, uh, and all the rest. Uh, but I think we talked a little bit about this already, right? People can get started cutting their teeth with some small multifamily just to, just to feel it out. A duplex, triplex, quad. You can... You can get a, a, a residential 30 year loan on that, right? Um, one thing that I've seen a lot of you know, investors just getting started is that they'll go and they'll buy a, a triplex or a quad. And um, it was a house that had been converted at one point, but the utilities never got converted. And some of these small towns in like Ohio or Cumberland. And, and then what happens is, man, it, it causes havoc on on the income that they get out of that asset because now they're responsible for that utility and the bickering that goes on between uh, neighbors. I remember I bought a duplex early in my career uh, and I went in knowing that the heat was not separately metered in this particular duplex. One person controlled it and it was a constant battle. Oh the person that controlled the heat and the other person would keep the windows open. And it was just like, so, I mean, it, it, the, the bill was ridiculous, right? So, Learn from my mistakes. Pro tip, always make sure that those units, the utilities are separately metered. And most of the time, the water, uh, the water is not separately metered. It's the gas and the electric that you want to make sure is separately metered, right? Jason, did you run into that with your building? Absolutely, yep. Yeah, uh, it, it was not separately metered, right? No, no, it's, it still isn't. One of them still isn't. Okay, how does that feel? Um, you can work around it. So they have a, a system out called rubs, which is ratio utility billing system. Um, you can use that, but honestly, I found that it's not necessarily needed all the time. So what you can do is, um, it's really like a marketing thing, right? You have your units, they're all on the same meter. You say this amount is your rent and this amount is your utility bills and utilities are included. So, um, you know, you just basically figure out how much that water bill is and then try to split that among, amongst the tenants. Got it. Okay, good to know. I didn't know that. Thanks, man. And we talked a little bit about this already, right? Um, your real estate asset is a business. Your job is to create value in that business by minimizing expenses, fixing it up, and increasing rents. Okay, next slide, Mr. Beckett. And Jason, do you agree with that 20% down being kind of the standard on a five plus unit yeah yeah you're not going to find much lower than that you probably i underwrite everything at 25 percent. if you can get 20 good but especially now in, in covid uh covid times and if you're not doing one of those million plus loans like with freddie or fanny uh um, you definitely should budget for for 25 percent got it cool no Okay, so let's go through some numbers to understand. Also, Rob, if you don't mind, I, I just got off the phone with my lender and the banks are looking for, you know, some type of reserve that you're going to hold in because, uh, you know, in COVID times, they want to make sure that you're going to be able to make uh, a certain number of uh, interest payments and have that in reserve. So that 20% is there. 
And then if you're going to be doing value add, right, you also have to account for what your renovation budget is going to be. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I mean, um, I know that they were asking for reserves on all the assets that I had. And it was like, show us where the cash is. And I had to like, you know, it was, it was always fun, always fun to show them everything. Right. So, um, okay. Net income of the asset drives value of the property. Your job as an operator is to increase the net income. So let's go through the numbers, Mark. Let's go to the next slide. I want Jason to get to cap rates. This is way better than my slide. <laughs> no, it's trash. Okay. Okay. So here I have like three different examples in here. Now imagine having a cap rate of 25.2%. This is something I got offline, right? It'd be crazy. But let's just look at this real fast, just to give everybody a basic understanding of what a cap rate is. Jesse, you want to work through it real fast? Um, yeah, let me just read through this. So a thousand, you, I guess they're taking that. Okay. That's the cap rate that they're buying the property at. Okay. Yeah. That would be a great, uh, yeah, that'd be ridiculous. Right. Yeah, that'd be great, yeah. right. Yeah. So, but, but very, you know, very basic high level gross rents, right. All the rents that you're collecting, and then you're going to be subtracting out your taxes, your maintenance, your insurance, possibly property management. And we're just giving you a very basic like high level, and that's going to bring your net income, right? Your net operating income, people call it your NOI. And then you're going to divide your NOI, your net income by the purchase price, which would give you your cap rate, right? Here in this market, you know, if you're getting, uh, you know, a cap rate of three to 5%, the, like what we're seeing in like the, you know, the DMV area, but Jason, your, your buildings are what in, where are you again? You're in, uh, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, Texas. And what are your, what the cap rates that you have out there? Man, right now, um, honestly, it's, you're seeing sixes. If you okay. can get uh, north of six, you're doing well right now, which is strange because, you know, a few years ago, you could probably look for seven, maybe even eight. Um, mm -hmm. they, those keep coming down and they, they sort of fall in line with interest rates, right? So as interest rates come down, people are going to afford more that drives the price up, which is going to drive down the, the cap rate. Um, but this formula that you have here is really everything that you need to know. It's the NOI divided by what's well, the purchase price divided by the NOI. And that gives you, um, that gives you the, your cap rate, right? And so you have it both in a way that you have here where you can determine what the cap rate is, but you also have to sort of know that in a, in a market as well. So before you go in, you need to know like cap rates are around this amount. Um, so you can plan your numbers on your, on going in and then coming out of a property. Yeah. In fact, we cover that in a couple of slides, you know, it's, it's, it's understanding. So Mark, maybe you can move forward a little bit. It's understanding what's happening it's in the next slide, but you can keep this here. It's understanding what's happening in a local market. So if you go in and you're running comps, you might do an analysis in four or five properties to get a baseline for what's happening in that market. And then say, okay, it looks like things are selling at an eight cap, right? In this market or a seven cap. And then you could start basing all your numbers off of that to, to kind of understand what, what the purchase price needs to be or what the NOI needs to be, right? Those combination of those two. So here, here's another example, right? Of the same thing that we just talked about, right? Your, your gross income being 9,000, 10% property management. So $900, maintenance 450, taxes 710, minus insurance this is a very basic number. Gives you your NOI of 6290 divided by a $40,000 purchase price gives you a 15.7% cap rate. And people right now on this call are going, where do I buy something for $40,000, right? That's like, that's what people are saying, right? Guys, believe it or not, there's places around the US where you can buy a duplex for $40,000. Now I'm not recommending that you do, right? But I'm saying that you can, right? And so, um, but this is just purely so that you get, get an understanding of how you get to that cap rate, right? So this is kind of what Jason was determining. Let's say something, right? 
Oh, Baltimore. There's Lee. Baltimore, for sure, right? For sure in Baltimore. So let's say you know that the cap rate in a given market is around 8%. And somebody's asking for, you know, 400000 for that building. Right? You can kind of reverse engineer and say, oh, what does that income level need to be? 400000 by an average cap rate of 8% gives you $32,000, right? So you can get, so this is what you were talking about, Jason, right? You can kind of get an understanding of what uh, cap rates are in the area and then what the income level needs to be for that, for the asking price of that asset. And you might find, heck, this is a good deal. Or you might say, man, they're asking way too much money for this asset, right? Um, so anyhow. I guess, Rob, you're saying you can kind of work the math either way. Now you have the formula, right? So if somebody says, I'm looking to sell a property, uh, it generates a net income of 32000 a year. Uh, what what would you give me for it? And if you said, all right, well, I want to make 8% on my money, then, well, I want an 8% cap rate, then it's uh, 32 divided by the 0.08, it gives give you 400000 right? Or vice versa, if they say, hey, I've got an apartment uh, that I'm looking to sell, it's at an 8 cap. Uh, and you know, it's, I'm asking 500,000 and it produces 30,000 a year in income, you'd be able to do the math and say, okay, well, this isn't actually, you may be calling it an eight cap, but if you're asking five and it generates 30, this is not actually an 8% cap. Rate, right? so you, you're asking too much for the asset. You, you yeah. use what you know to figure out what you don't know yet to see uh, what's the ratio in the formula. Um, cool. All right. Yeah, so here, use the cap rate to justify the income level of the investment property. If you know the cap rates of the area, you can figure out what the income level should be, and you can determine this by running the comps in a given area, right? I imagine, Jason, when you were buying in Tennessee, you were analyzing lots of property, right, in the beginning to kind of understand what's normal in this market, right? Every market has a baseline, and what's normal in Tennessee may not be normal in Florida, or Minnesota, right? Because there's different costs in Minnesota compared to Florida and Tennessee. Well, <clears throat> all right. Okay, let's go to the next slide. All right. And we Just, uh, a quick yeah. comment on that. Like, I, I didn't, I didn't, I wasn't as involved in cap rate information and analysis when I got started, right? To me, it was still about cash flow. And I think that if you, if you just focus on cash flow, then the cap rate will fall into place, right? But once you start trying to, I mean, it's something that you should be very cognizant of, right? Because it is going to determine your exit. But if you're going in and you don't necessarily know all this stuff, you don't know the cap rate of a given market, if you just focus on cash flow to say, all right, these are the expenses, this is how much they're asking, is this going to cash flow for me or not? Like, am I going to make money from this property or not? you'll find out that you're buying at the right cap rate when that works. Jason, but what a lot of people don't realize is that when you're buying a multifamily, the operating costs on those assets are significantly higher than when they're single family homes, right? So what I learned was, you know, somebody came to me and they showed me, you know, their, their, um, if they showed me their P&Ls on their asset for the last two or three years, and I saw that their operating cost was only 25%, I was suspect, right? I started becoming something like, how could it just be 25%, right? Like something doesn't make sense because I, because when I was managing my assets, my multifamilies, I realized that there were upwards of like 45 and 50%, right? Um, well, I mean, what's the operating cost on your property in Tennessee? Um, I haven't done... I haven't done the numbers on that one in a while, but we are probably, we're probably right around that 45% range. Um, yeah. Everything together. And you, yeah, you'll, that, find, you'll find people who are trying to sell and they're saying my expense ratio is like 30%. And they, they actually might be doing it, but you have to sort of think about how you want to operate that property, right? Do you want to do what that person does? So they might be cutting their own grass. They might be handling maintenance calls. They might be handling tenant calls at night. And so, that yeah, they save money and, and they run it that way. But are you going to do that or not? So you have to sort of back into your own numbers when you're trying to come up with, uh, with the price. 
Yeah, absolutely not. They're they're running it at a 30%, but they don't have a, a manager in place and I want to pay a manager. So it's going to cost me 40% because I don't want to take the calls. I don't want to cut the grass. I don't want to deal with the handyman, right? I, I, I'm buying this as a business and I want somebody to help me operate that business. No. Right? So this is important, right? Asking for the historical operating data with a detailed view of all the expenses. This is really important, right? So for example, somebody can give you the historical operating data for your asset and it might just have a line item that says utilities, $20,000, okay? Well, why do you want it so that it's break, broken down by utilities, right? So I, I would wanna see it where I would say, okay, here's the water and this is what the cost was. Here's the gas, this is what the cost was. Here's the electric, this is what the cost was. Especially when you've been running an analysis of other assets in that area, numbers start jumping out to you. You're like, why is the water so expensive in this building compared to other buildings? Seems off, right? Or why is the why is the common area heat more expensive in this building than in other buildings? Well, it could be because it's not a well insulated building. And you would need to know that, right? It's not a well insulated building, then you could run the risk of it being unaffordable for tenants in that building. And in cold markets, I've had issues where I had a building that, you know, in fact, actually, I'll show you the guys this right here. Look at this. This is actually a marketer. Somebody sent me this. Can you read what that says? It says, is, is, it says, is this your property? Is this your property? This is a triplex that I own. This is an investor that sent me this postcard. It's actually pretty cool. He's now sent me one, one a month, last couple months, right? And um, this building is poorly insulated. And because it's poorly insulated uh, during the winter times, I have a high turnover rate turnover rate. And so I need to fix that problem. I have a problem here in this business. Uh, yeah, in this asset, which I view as a business. And so when you ask for the historical operating data, it can be very revealing to you. Uh, and I suspect, Jason, that when you were buying your properties, you asked for all the financials along with, did you ask for tax returns too? Or did you just ask for P&Ls? Or what did you learn in that process? I did. So one, one of the things that you'll find when you're looking at smaller properties is because you're buying it from an individual, you won't necessarily get the prettiest of financials. A lot of times if you're buying the bigger stuff, yes, they'll have a, a T12, a rent roll. If you don't know what a T12 is, it's just a list of all the income and list of all the expenses, uh, like a profit and loss statement or something like that. But if you're buying something small, they may not have that. So you sort of have to Take what they give you, but take it with a grain of salt and know that you're going to have to <clears throat> understand how you're going to operate that property. I did ask for tax returns. However, I wouldn't advise anybody to go buy a property just based off of somebody else's tax return. Got it. Good advice. Okay. I did, but don't do what I did. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, Mr. Beckett. Well, and before we move on, is there anything else? Uh, Jason or Rob, in your experience, that you're looking for for inefficiencies or things that maybe you hope to be able to improve after you buy it? Yeah, the number one is rent, um, right? That's that's going to be the biggest pusher of your top line. It's just being if you if you're able to increase rents, so you may find something. You know, they're renting eight hundred dollars a month. You might be able to push that to nine hundred uh, to a thousand dollars a month, just because that's what the market warrants. And if you do your research and sort of look what's around you and say, okay, in this area, um, properties can go for this amount, then you look for that. You also look to cut down expenses however you can. So like Rob mentioned, you see the utility bills are higher. Um, you can also do market research to say if maybe we can build back the tenants for some of that uh, utility costs, right? So you can put some of the electric or the water bill onto those tenants. And, and then just inefficiencies, right? Too many people on a property, uh, too much staff. You basically look how you can run the property, but still trim off all the excess fat um, to run it well and efficiently, but still um, it's a business, right? So you're still looking to just maximize the income that you can. Kathleen had a uh, question. She said, do you interview, do you interview tenants? 
So I never interviewed tenants, but I definitely paid attention to how they lived when I walked through that asset, right? And most of the time I was like, Ooh, okay, we, we're gonna have to upgrade the tenant profile of this building. And by the way, that's the opportunity. You can upgrade the tenant profile in a building. We'll talk a little bit about how you do that through, through you know, turning over units. And, uh, and in fact, actually, we might even talk about it on the next slide, Mr. Beckett. Oh, okay. So we'll actually, it's a slide after this. So, okay. Now you understand cap rates. You understand that you, you, this is a little, this is a business, right? Your opportunity is to decrease expenses and increase revenue like any, any business. And you can create value by doing that. But people always say, how do I get started? How do I buy an apartment building? Well, here's, here's a great step. This guy sent me a postcard. I've owned this building for over a decade right? It's a triplex. That's one way, right? Of course, you can go on MLS and LoopNet and CoStar, but so is everybody else. Everybody else is doing that too. And so in, in an environment like we're in right now, you're going to have to, you're going to have to build a dream team and you're going to have to put the word out there, right? Just like you do. It's no different than when you're trying to find a residential investment. You're going to pick an area. You're going to learn that area better than anybody else. There's some numbers that you're going to want to know. You're going to know, hey, is there job growth here? Is, the po is there population growth here? What are the income levels in this area? I want to be going into areas that I see population growth and income growth. I don't want to see a population decline, which you know ha happens, by the way. It happens in many small towns. And so that's important to be paying attention to population growth, right? And then we talked about understanding the cap rates in a given area and understanding the comps for those cap rates, for those properties. And, uh, and then I, I would start lining up money. Where am I gonna get these sources of income when I do find my deal, when I do find a deal, where am I gonna get it? Am I gonna get it from an equity line? Am I gonna go to a self-directed? Am I gonna partner with people? You know, um, savings, banks, syndicating deals. You know, this isn't, this topic isn't about, you know, we did how to syndicate deals and using your self-directed IRA last month. So watch that, right, um, if you haven't watched it. But you want to start thinking about where you're going to get some of this income. But the most important thing is find the asset. Because once you put that at, actually, Mark, go to the next slide. Once you put that asset under contract, um, you know, once you put that asset under contract, you can do your due diligence on it, right? You have a feasibility study. Uh, but let me ask you, Jason, did you, when you started investing in Tennessee, did you find a broker or did you do it all yourself? Yeah, I didn't have a broker uh, at all. I was, I was really looking on those, those areas, LoopNet, and it was actually a residential broker. So um, in a market like this, just look everywhere that you can, right? Because you can find deals just because it's listed with a residential agent that, may or may not know what they're doing with the commercial property. And they'll either put a astronomical price, it's way too much, it doesn't make sense, or they'll list it way too low for what it's worth. In my case, I got lucky and they listed it for, uh, worth less than what it was worth um, and was able to find a deal like that. So you just got to start looking everywhere you can. Um, and to go back just for a quick, quick second to what Kathleen asked, like, do you interview t uh, tenants? When, you're, when you buy a property, you're gonna walk through the units uh, on closing. This is gonna be way after once you got it under contract and you're sort of in that due diligence stage. But in a unit, I'm always gonna ask that tenant, you know, how they like living there. Um, just talk to them, sort of keep that tenant talking while you're going through checking out everything you're doing on your inspection because you'll find out things. Uh, they may say, oh, we got roaches in here like crazy or you know, it's bed bugs all over there. And you may not have been thinking about that, but that's that person's home. So they know that property way better than, than you do just going in as an owner. Just someone to say that. Bed bugs, a big issue. Yeah. Big issue. <laughs> uh, drive for dollars. I'm a big fan of still, I love driving the areas, my target areas and dreaming about what I want to buy in that area and looking at the signs and who are the brokers that have the signs or who are the contractors that, that are doing the work in that area? I'll stop off. I'll talk to contractors. I'll ask them if they know of any property that's coming up on the market. I'll 
write a target list of properties that look uh, like they need some work. And then I'll do what this guy did, right? I'll send something like this. I'll build a list and then just put somebody on a automatic mailing campaign saying, if you're interested in selling, I'm interested in buying. You just never know when you're gonna catch somebody, right? Uh, you could research absentee landlords in your target area and send them letters. Um, and then make offers, analyze deals, right? Secure the property, put it, with, have a feasibility study in there. You have your ability to do your due diligence. Um, don't just analyze, 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 analyze. You got to analyze and make some offers and put stuff under contract and go through that process. There's just no better way to learn than, than by actually doing, right? And then uh, when you find the one you like, and you've uh, and you vetted it well. You close, right? And then you go, and then you're like Jason. You say, "What did I get myself into? I purchased this apartment building, and now what do I? This is this is more than what I thought. Did that happen? Did that happen to you, Jason? Or am I the only one? I'm like, okay. no, no, definitely, definitely, especially on the first one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you still did well on that first one, right? No. Yeah, there, there's never really, um, like, there's never a purchase that just goes smoothly. At least I, if there is, I'm not buying them. There's always <laughs> something that, that sort of comes out where you're like, okay, I wasn't expecting that, uh, didn't know about this, you know. So I know some people can be very analytical and you're sort of trying to, to calculate everything that could happen it can go wrong but you need to have enough information you need to like the property enough to want to pursue it but at the same time understand that you're going in and there's going to be um something that you didn't see at least expect that right so okay so you got to execute your business plan you purchased it right and hopefully what you've done is this is a business and now you're going to work on executing a business plan are these the steps that you're looking at, Jason? Stable um, property. Yep, 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 definitely. So, on a typical value add deal, um, you want to clean it up from the outside first, because that's what tenants are going to see when they come in. And so, you're trying to appeal to that new resident and making sure that the yard is trimmed. You may want to change the signs on the property. If you're going to do anything external, like paint it up, pretty it up, make sure the parking lot looks nice. You do all that stuff first, and then you start to go inside the unit um, and make the interiors look good. And you can do that, you know, one unit at a time, handful of units at a time as you, as you go. Uh, but yeah, curb appeal, look to raise the rents once you do that, once you've done that outside so that it's more appealing to somebody, and then you've done the inside on just one unit, now you've got something that a, a potential renter may be attracted to, and that's when you can start increasing the, increasing the rent. Okay. And then, and then let's say you've now stabilized it at these higher rents, right? What are you doing? You just keep it. You take cash out, you do another one, you sell it. What's been your plan? Personally, I like to, I like to keep it, flip it to myself, right? So um, you buy it, you increase the NOI, which increases the value. And then you, you buy it again at a higher price, but one that gets you all your money back out that you put in in the first place. Give people an example of maybe one of the deals that you, you've done recently that you're like, okay, this was, this is one that I did that I felt really good about. Um, yeah. So, so just recently back in, back in March, uh, yeah, in the, in the middle of COVID, uh, we wow. financed one of the first syndications I did. Um, so we went into that property. Um, we had to raise maybe about half a million dollars and um, we did the value add process still hold the assets right now. And I pulled out probably $300,000 of, of that capital. So uh, we sat on some, some went back to investors and we still hold the asset and still pays out, you know, distributions of 8%. So that's a good one. That's just what you can do. Like you put money in, you take money out and you keep the asset and continue to the cash flow. Okay. What about that first one that you bought? How did it work out? Um, that one was even, it was for my own personal um, portfolio. So it wasn't any investors involved in that. But with that one, I, I put in money. Um, I put in probably 250, 300 grand into that property. And then I was able to refinance that out and get, <clears throat> you know, I got all my money out and then I made 
a little bit on top, not a lot, maybe like 30,000 or so, but still um, to have all my money back out of the property, still own it and it's still cash flow. So I like that strategy. I haven't really sold anything uh, because if it pays me every month, then I just, I like to hold it. And how did you, when you, when you calculated the new value, cause you had to get your, all your money back out. So it had the value at a higher number. What were you into it for? What was the valuation? Um, yeah, so I bought it probably, I bought it at around 320,000. I put, you know, well, I'll say I put probably two, 250 in it and then it appraised for 800 grand. Not too shabby. That's nice. Okay, cool. Okay. Anybody have questions about that, by the way? Let's go back real fast. Anybody have questions about the psychology of why, do, what do you think holds people back? I think Mark probably was alluding to this before, but what holds people back from doing multifamily? What do you think is the, the thing that holds people back? Is it probably something wrapped around fear? Fear. 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 Okay. Uh, fear and, and, and the belief or thought that this is going to be much harder and more difficult than acquiring a single family. So I would have to say, you have to go into this with the growth mindset. You can't have a fixed mindset. Mm -hmm. and, and by saying that is you have to be comfortable asking other people for money, but knowing that you're not asking them for money to go and spend it you're actually, you actually need to convince them that this is a sound investment and they're gonna actually make money. And when I first started this, I believed that, hey, I was asking people for money. Whereas okay. now I'm telling people, well, I have a sound investment and do you wanna make some money with me? Mm -hmm. Yeah, when you're, when it's, you're essentially giving, when, when you really are believe in it and you're confident in it, you know that you realize that you're giving people a gift. Oh yeah. Yeah. You, you know, if you're, if you know it and you know the numbers inside and out and you've gone through this rodeo before and you, you, you're giving people. And that's why, by the way, what I find is that normally investors will travel in packs because they, they will, they'll develop a core group of like eight or nine people, 10 people. And you just pop one project, then another project, then another project. Cause a level of trust is built up around those people that have been in projects together. At least that's what I've seen, right? Um, if you can prove to people that you're going to give them a solid return on their money, that's it, right? Everybody, well, those who have money to invest are looking for a return. And if you can prove yourself in being able to protect that principle plus to give them that return, what more do you have to do? So what areas are you guys seeing, right, where people are investing in multifamily? I know people on here, here in Nova and in D.C. are probably saying, hey, this is just it's so hard to get any these numbers to make sense here. And it is, really is, right? Um, what areas are you guys seeing? Baltimore, Tennessee, Oklahoma. Utah, I mean, you tell me what you guys are saying. You know this better than I do. Carolina. I say, um, there's two markets to be in, right? You can either be in the deal market or you can be in the money market, right? So uh, being in the D.C. area, it's like a money market, right? Because it's, a, it's a, a high net worth market. People there have money to invest, but it's not going to be a place where you're just going to buy a, a deal that's going to kick off a lot of of cash flow on a monthly basis, but you may be in another market where it's it's you know a deal market where people may not make that much money, but there's deals galore, and you can find uh, properties like we discussed in Baltimore, you know, forty thousand dollars. So figuring out what market you're in, and then sort of using that to to strategize. So the perfect thing to do is be like, if you're in the D.C. area, okay, I'm a money market. Let me find you know, a few money partners, and then let me go partner with somebody who may be in a deal market, or maybe I'll do the legwork and travel to a deal market to do the research. But I, I wouldn't advise anybody to do a deal in their backyard just because you're comfortable with it. Um, and some people, a lot of people do it, you know, I just want to be able to see it, I want to be able to touch it, I want to be able to feel it. 
that's that's fine, but you're really shortchanging yourself long term because you're going into such a high price point. You know, you've got to do so much. Luckily, I can't do anything on a property, which is beneficial to me because I know if anything goes wrong, if you call me up, say, Jason, there's there's a leak. I'm not going over there with a wrench and a blowtorch or whatever the hell you <laughs> I don't know. I, I'm just going to call somebody else to do that. So if you have that mindset, then really any place where the numbers make sense can be your market. Cool. I have a friend of mine that does this in uh, in uh, Utah. Loves Utah. Right. And then I was recently, he was trying to get me, or he's trying, he's convincing me to go to Oklahoma City. Right, because it's a it's a fast paced growing market in Oklahoma City. Anybody on here invest? Like I own property down in um, St. Pete, Florida, which I like. I like St. Pete a lot, Tampa Bay area. Uh, anybody invest in any other markets that are on here that they like? That the assets are doing well. Carolinas. All the Carolinas, anywhere in north and south. Any place where the cost of living is low and people are moving from these tier one cities, they're trying to get out, especially with COVID, and they're moving to low cost of living places where they could actually still afford to buy a house on probably a, a, a single uh, family income. So they may not be moving into that that multifamily asset at first, but they want to be in an area where they like to live, et cetera. So I would say those areas are places where renters are going. And also when you start to see companies creating their headquarters or moving their headquarters to places, that's, that's places that are going to create jobs and in creating jobs, they will have a demand for, for multifamily rentals. People don't really... I would say now with this new generation, owning a home isn't their primary uh, goal, right? A lot of millennials want that flexibility to be able to up and go wherever they want to go. But now with COVID, I believe people are going to have, people have the opportunity to work from anywhere, right? Yeah. So I, I think that the dynamics are going to change a little bit. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I just had some neighbors of mine move. They sold their property here in Reston and they moved to Alabama. Uh, he works for the FBI and I guess the FBI has now set up a new location. And supposedly Alabama is growing by leaps and bounds. I'm like, Alabama, but okay. Um, it's a hot market. They yeah, man, I guess. That's just goes to show you. I'm in my little bubble. I don't know, but that's what they said. They said it's a hot market. And that it's beautiful and I need to go down there and visit and that real estate is. So I think, it, you know, part of us building this network and building and, you know, we want to take this and, and make a global network is to be able to deal with and work with partners in other parts of the country so that they give, can give us market intelligence so we can all invest together in other parts, right? I know a lot of people do that already, but I think that that's part of what will happen with GRID and the GRID leadership where we're bringing on a leader in Austin, Texas, um, you know, in the next, uh, in the next month. And, um, and that's an interesting market. You know, Austin, Texas is a super hot market. And then they'll probably refer us to somebody in Denton, Texas or other parts in Texas. And then we'll be able to have chapters that are there and be able to invest with partners in those areas. So, um, Kathleen said Huntsville, the market's on fire. Yeah, the next Fairfax County, 20 years down the road. Ooh, well, that's that's kind of cool. We'll do that. I'll have to look at that. So Where do you go to find out what the next hot market is? I guess groups like this, you're <laughs> going to meetups in Alabama? Um, yeah, so, so there's... Uh, there's websites that you can go to. One of them is called Local Market Monitor, um, and there's there's also there's also different areas that you can do to to go and sort of search. Now the thing is when you're when you go to one of these websites and you look at something that maybe is on um, 
CSNBC or something like that, and they're talking about all the growth in some market. You got to know that every investor in the world is about to go to that market too. Um, but there's there's other websites like Best Places, um, City Data, and they'll just tell you. Um, they basically give you a lot of attributes of a particular market, and then you can determine whether that market is good or not. So it'll tell you like things like where the population has gone over the past. Uh, 20 years or so. You want to make sure that that's trending up. It'll tell you about jobs, the employers that have come there and, and whether that's trending up. And so once you see all those things headed in the right trajectory, then you know that that's sort of a hot, a hot market. So you can look for websites and, and like local market monitor is one that will list it out. Um, there's another one right now that really just lists out job growth and um, give me a minute. I'll look it up and try to drop, drop it in the chat. But you can sort of go from the top down, right? Just saying where the best places to be at for job growth with a Google search and then just see what comes up. Or you can back into a market and say, oh, uh, you know what? I've got family in Pensacola, Florida. Let me just go to city data or best places and just see what's going on in Pensacola to see if I, I like being there or not. I think job growth has got to be maybe next to population growth, one of the most important things to look at at any market anywhere, right? Yeah, uh, everything's got its price, and I guess there are good deals everywhere. But my guess is probably Detroit, Buffalo, cities where population is declining is maybe not the best place to park money. Uh, Rob, maybe you can speak a little to investing in a small town that has a stable to perhaps shrinking population and job base. It kind of puts a lid on rent increases, right? Yeah, you know, like a market that I went into is just the, the you know, the, the average age is pretty high because the young people leave and they go to the city. And, uh, and so you see every year a slight decline in population. Um, and what that does is just kind of cap values. Like values haven't moved in over a decade. What you're saying is if, if the local minister is like in charge of the politics and he is banned dancing. That's right. Not not a good town for investing in for an apartment. Not a good town. Definitely not a good town. Got it. All right. Not a good town. Want that. Um, yeah. Well, I'd like to say something a little contrary to, to this topic, right? Because there, there are cities out like Baltimore. I haven't looked in a while, but Baltimore, the population has been declining for years. Uh, Chicago is another one of them, right? And so when you're looking at a market, there's there's really like a mini market within a market, right? So you have, you may say, I, I don't necessarily want to be everywhere in Baltimore, but there's definitely areas that are having growth and that job coming in. And so um, just want to mention that, right? So when you, if you like a place, right, you have to sort of get a little bit more granular to say, what do I like about this place? Or where's the path of progress at? Or what companies are coming in here? And maybe if I'm around a certain corridor or on the side of the city, there's a lot of growth going on there. And so even though the overall population might be declining, um, you can still be okay and make money just because you bought in the right area. Jason, that's a great point. Like I always say, every market, any market, ha the, we always have to find out how to make money in that market. Like there are certain markets, like in the market that I'm talking about, um, I found that there was a lot of landlords that weren't doing well, but then there was several of them that were doing extremely well because they concentrated on a particular type of product. They understood the product that rented well. They understood the little pockets that rented well. And they just did that over and over and over again. And by the way, different strategies work really well in certain markets, like in that market, owner financing was super hot and profitable, right? To owner finance assets. And I found this gentleman who owned, you know, 40 properties that he, they were all owner financed and he'd been doing it for 30 years. And he's like, I've never had to foreclose. I, I think he said he had to foreclose on two people in 40 years, right? And that he loved his business and that he wasn't a landlord. Like he was like, he was a, I mean, he owner financed everybody. He was a, uh, he was like the first conduit for people to get loans. Now he was expensive, right? He was eight to 10%. Um, 
but it but uh but that's how he did it right and by the way that's what the rents were what's interesting is like the, like the, charging somebody eight to ten percent in this market was equivalent to what the rental price was in that market except now they weren't calling you with leaky toilets and 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 broken windows and and you know problems because they own the asset he was just financing it. that makes sense so yeah, and I wonder if anyone has ever tried to owner finance a condo. That's that's what you would do if you had a 10 unit apartment building, right? If you wanted to do that, you first have to convert the condo. And then instead of just selling those condo units, you sell them owner finance. The same kind of extra leverage and juice that you're talking about that you got on your single family property. I don't see why you couldn't do it. Mechanics are the same. Have you thought about that as an exit strategy, Jason, about going condo on any of your units and selling them individually? I have now. <laughs> yeah, yeah no, no, that's, that's a great idea, Mark. It, it, it has to work, I think, with the market cycle that Lee was talking about earlier and, and whether or not people are really looking to own in your, in your market in that cycle. It was a huge thing in the... Uh, Early 2000s, 2000 to 2006, if you had an apartment building, the, the developers I worked for would buy apartment buildings, convert them to condo, sell them all to other investors, right, on the way up in the bubble, make a ton of money, uh, and, and then be out that way. Just take an old, dumpy apartment building, fix it up with no intention of renting it, go straight to condo conversion, uh, and sell them out. Uh, haven't seen that in a while. Uh, but you are seeing some people starting to build condos again. So condo conversion may eventually come back as an option. Well, I mean, Mark, I think yeah, I've seen that play in the mobile home park space where, you know, those assets typically trade for about 40 to 50,000. And if you can, you know, get them, you do a, like a seller financing, they have to come with a down payment, five or $6,000. Right, really with mobile home parks, they're not going to appreciate in price for the most part. But if these people don't perform, you get that down payment, right? That becomes yours. You get a new tenant and you start it all over again on an asset that probably wasn't going to appreciate altogether. So I've, yeah. I've, I've heard others doing that play in uh, mobile homes. I, I think it makes a lot of sense in a market like that, where like it's you're not seeing a lot of a lot of appreciation and it's really, you know, your, your, your owner financing is a better play than being a landlord. But this particular topic is about being a landlord and buying apartment buildings. And Jason, hey, I appreciate you pouring into us. Any last words of wisdom on either getting started or, or things we need to be cognizant of before we, we break and let you go? Um, no, just like if you're thinking about doing it, don't do it alone. I, I made that mistake uh, when I first got started. And there are things that would be so obvious if I had to just talk to somebody. Right. And so I'm here tonight. Um, if anybody who's thinking about it wants, uh, you know, has a question or something, I'd say reach out. Um, Jason, put your, put your name in the chat, name, phone number. Oh, you already did. There you go. Oh no, that's different. No, but, I don't think so. But okay, put uh, all your info in there. Yeah, I'll I'll do that. I'll just that's my my best advice right there. Just don't go at it alone. Find somebody else who who's willing to help you, who's done it before. You can talk to me. Uh, you can probably talk to Lee. Um, just surround yourself with people who are doing it, and you'll find that your process goes a lot a lot smoother. And Jason, let me ask you, uh, what is next for? For you, do you see yourself just continuing to look for these same properties? Are you looking to buy larger? Are you looking to possibly build one day? What do you, um, what do you see your business doing in five years? I, I would like to build one day, but I haven't. Um, I haven't really started the process of trying to do that right now. It's just um, trying to be like Rob, right? Trying to systematize everything and get a business that sort of works by itself. So that that's really where I'm at. Uh, continuously looking for deals and and growing the portfolio. Cool. I think Rob is called the chief visionary officer, isn't it, Rob? That's right. Chief visionary officer. Build a vision. 
You know, it's it's so interesting because the longer I've been doing this now, just, you know, building businesses, it really is, you know, building great systems and having great people that that um, that are part of that system. And it's fun, right? What I, when you start analyzing apartments, you just realize these are little businesses. And the job of that little business is the same job that I have in my business, which is decrease expenses, increase revenue, right? Decrease expenses, increase revenue, and provide value to the market because value gets rewarded. And value is making your units better, making it a better place for people to live, creating great curb appeal, having a good good reputation for that building, right? Um, being a, a landlord that has a good reputation that people want to stay with. Because I'm sure, like you guys have discovered, I've discovered, is that it's the churn that kills you in this business, right? It's tenant turnover that kills you. If you can get long-term tenants because you've got a great asset, a great building, you take care of it, you don't, you're not falling back on deferred maintenance, people will stay with you for a long time, right? And that makes, uh, increases your profitability in that asset. So, well, guys, I Lee, Jason, Mark Beckett, uh, Kathleen, thank you for your input and quest like questions. I love it. If you guys enjoyed this, leave us a review on Meetup, on Facebook, right? Um, RSVP for next month's event. Uh, what do you guys think? Are you guys seeing events opening up? Are you started, starting to see people doing events or no? I'm, no. No. <laughs> I'm, start, I'm yeah. thinking, I know, I'm thinking though, probably in the new year, we'll probably do a combination of the two. We'll have an event and we'll make it so that it's only five or 10 people in the room max. And then the rest will be recorded because I don't know about you guys, but I, I definitely, I get energy from seeing people and being around people and, uh, and obviously in a, in a safe and socially distant manner, manner wearing my mask, look, my cosmic mask, got my cosmic mask on. Oh, nice. nice. Yeah. And hey, so are you doing a virtual Christmas party this year? I know you typically have an annual Christmas party. I yeah. know. What are I we going to do for that? Hold the tacos up to the camera? <laughs> Man, I don't know. I don't know. We got to figure that out. We got two months to figure it out. Maybe we'll do some kind of like charity online poker. I've got a friend that did that, and that sounded like a lot of fun. Um, hey. Hey, hey, Rob, one of the, you, you ask for data. Uh, I would say when I first started doing this, I also went out to Marcus and Millichap and they always give lots of free information. They, they generate an annual report probably in, in January or February. So you could always go there and get that. And if you're looking at investing in a particular region, they also have Metro reports that dive into a particular area. So that's also free. It's a lot of information to read, but it will definitely help you to learn a business. Yeah, they do a good job with that. Right? And it's all free. They give it away. It's awesome. Yeah, I remember early in my career when I was trying to figure out like what who I wanted to be in the world of real estate, I was looking at a lot of what they were doing, right? Um, Kathleen, it is Marcus and Millichap. They're a... They're a brokerage that concentrates on uh, commercial property. And they've got like all different verticals within there. Yep. Marcus and Milchap. Um, I was talking to a good friend of mine today who owns a bunch of um, standalone triple net lease commercial properties. Mm. And, you know, it is, it's definitely been a challenge, right? Because he's got like, He's got auto body shop, uh, great location though, but he's got restaurants. I mean, he's got eight in Old Town, Alexandria, right? Some of them are restaurants, ice cream shop. I mean, it's tough for those guys, right? For those tenants to be making ends meet, which makes it hard for, for them to make ends meet. Um, but he sounds he sounds up, up optimistic and upbeat. But there's lots of guys on the commercial space. There is tons of renegotiation that's going on with commercial property right now, right? Where people have deferred for a long time and now they're tacking it on to 
uh, the rent that's due. And there's a lot of renegotiation of the renegotiation. So I would imagine that's going to happen in the apartment space too, right? If those apartments are occupied by restaurant workers, uh, then there's going to be some distress. In the, the market. Already, you're starting to see rents are going down and the president had a lot of bad news for people today. Not, not saying that there's politics, but uh, he called off the fact that they were going to try to negotiate a second round of stimulus. So if that doesn't happen until after the election, we still got to make it through, you know, October and November. And then sometime after that, before you might get a second wave of stimulus and then COVID is, is actually increasing in many states. So I think the, we're still not out of the woods just yet, right? Yep. No, not at all. My powder dry not. right now. Keep your right. powder dry. Watch, watch this space. Jad actually said I, he was lucky enough to find 16 unit family in Calverton, Virginia, near Manassas. Never heard of Calverton. For 950, purchase six months in place, 4% cap rate. People are paying 400 for one bedroom. Section eight for the zip pays twelve ninety five. Right. Yes, section eight might be a good thing to do because the government is going to pay that. You don't have to worry about the, the tenant. Yeah. 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 That's that's got to be a blessing for section eight landlords to to have that backstop. But Yukiko basically told me the other day that if the government wants, because Yukiko is highly invested in DC that if the government wants, they can reduce your, your Section 8 rent. So it, it's it's not like foolproof because I've never heard it happening, but she did say that that's a risk that she's, she's taking on. The government can just say, hey, rents are going to be lower for Section 8 two-bedrooms, and you just have to deal with it. Who else owns it? Anybody else here own, own a property in D.C.? I don't. It's so funny because I asked her, she's like, <laughs> Yukiko's so funny. She's like, I don't like DC, right? <laughs> she's like, well, she, loves D she just doesn't like the one property that she has in DC. All of the other ones that she has in DC, she loves them. She made it's a killing. Cool. I know, I know. One property is giving her a headache for sure. Yes. Awesome. Hey guys, well, yeah, I got to think about the, the, the party this year because we've got to do the award. The Deal Monster Award. We still have to have an online Deal Monster Award. So it should be fun. Um, uh, Believe you and I should talk. We should catch up and talk. All right. I'll, I'll shoot you a mail. Try to find some time on your calendar. Let's do it. Let's do it. Are All you right. meeting people face to face or are you just doing Zooms? No. This guy, he called me like on Friday and he said he wanted to meet. And then uh, I told him, no, brother, I'm doing Zoom. Two days later, he told me he came up positive with COVID. So Ooh, I'm, like, yeah. I'm glad I didn't meet you. I'm in my bubble for right now. I'm Good to know bubble. you've been networking with the president, Lee. <laughs> okay, guys. Sorry, he wasn't the president. For sure, he wasn't the president. Well, guys, we'll make it a great right. go, go to your family. We appreciate you you spending some time with us tonight. Jason, thank you very much. It was awesome. Hey, appreciate you. Appreciate, appreciate you, you guys. Thank you. Hey, Jason, take care. All right, take care, bro. guys. All right, All right. guys. Thanks for coming out.